Hello, my name is Justin. Today I'm going to teach you how to use the make.com, formerly Integromat, platform to create automations across any software or platforms that you're using. Now there are a couple of tools out there like this. Um, another really common one is Zapier. Um, I'm going to be teaching Make because it does the same thing, but it's more powerful. So Zapier is very linear. You kind of have a, a set of steps that have to happen one after the other. You can have them kind of splitting into different branches, um, but you only have one option to do that within any automation, and the, the interface is pretty clunky. Whereas Make, you can kind of split an infinite number of times, have infinite number of actions, and it's a much nicer interface to work with. So in general, Make is much more powerful, um, and that's why I prefer to use it. The learning curve is a little bit steeper, um, but that's exactly what this video is for. I'm here to make that learning curve really, really easy and much, much flatter. By the end of this video, my aim is that you know what all the key areas of Make are and how to use them, so you understand how automation scenarios work, and can set up automations for your business, including triggers, searches, actions, routing, and scheduling. So let's dive in. First of all, the interface. This is what you'll see when you come into uh, make.com for the first time. And so here are the key areas that you need to pay attention to. All the rest you can pretty much ignore. So first of all, over on the right, you've got your operations and data transfer. This is your limits. So depending on which plan you've selected and paid for, um, you'll have different limits. It's worthwhile keeping an eye on these. If you do hit 100%, then your automations will stop working until your next um, month has rolled around. So good to keep an eye on. That's under the organization tab up the top here. The other three tabs that you're likely to use are scenarios. That's where, where everything is, all your automations that you build. They'll all live under there. Um, connections and webhooks, you won't look at too often, um, but connections is just a list of all the um, software platforms that you've linked to make so that you can use them in your automations. So every once in a while, you might go through there, maybe delete some or get rid of some old ones, for example. Webhooks are basically listeners that you've set up in those platforms. So again, you probably won't look at them most of the time, but every once in a while you might go through and clean them up. Now, the rest of this, uh, you probably aren't gonna look at. So team, if you do have multiple people using Make, you might look, use this to uh, organize permissions to those people, uh, but oftentimes you'll just be using Make as a, a single person account. Uh, it's a little bit cheaper that way. Templates, again, if you are a very large business, you might template automations so you can quickly create new automations. Um, but for most people, you'd never need to recreate an automation that many times. So it's, it's not that commonly used. And then all the stuff down here, keys, devices, data stores, and data structures, that's for really quite advanced um, work when you're particularly getting into basically using make.com as like a, the back end of a, a software. Like that's, you're really heading towards coding and in-depth um, automation. So most people will achieve 99.999% of what they want in make. Uh, without ever having to touch any of these. So in this video, we're definitely not going to go into them. Resource Hub is actually quite useful. It's got some trainings in there. You might like to look at that. Okay, so now that we know what's important, uh, we can start to jump into them. So first of all, let's have a look at scenarios. So here are some scenarios here. Each one of these is an automation uh, that will have a one trigger. Key defining factor of a scenario is that each scenario can only have one trigger. And then it will have a whole series of actions. And you can see here, it's got little um, icons. So this one has that, these ones have triggers that are in ClickUp. This one has a trigger that is a Google form and then it has multiple actions um, after that. You can see this one has actually 13 more actions after the trigger. They can be on or off. And if we click on one of them, it will open it up. When it opens up, we've got three tabs across the top here. Diagram is what we'll most commonly look at. And this is how we've set it up. So we've got the trigger on the, the starting module. And then we've got the line going to multiple actions that will happen one after the other. Down the bottom here, we can just see how often it's being used. And on the right, we've got our history. And we can look at any uh, run if we click on it. That will take us into the history tab and one particular history. So if we click on the history tab, we'll see all the history and all the successful runs of this uh, scenario. If we get the details, it'll take us into the details of one particular run. Now if we click on this little one icon, we will be able to see exactly which information came through. So most of the time you won't need to look at that. For this video, we'll just be looking at the diagram tab. Um, incomplete executions is also good. If something does go wrong and an execution got stuck halfway through, um, we can rerun that. Cool. Let's create a new scenario here. So we can give it a name in the top left. We can choose where our trigger is and which platform it should be watching um, to, to trigger it. For example, let's say we go with Google Sheets. And then we can choose one of our triggers up the top here. So we might watch, watch uh, for new rows. We'll select that one. 
Now, first of all, what it's going to ask is for a connection. So we need to authorize um, make to access our data in that platform. You can see I've already got an authorization done here, so I can simply select that one, or I can hit add to add a new one. So we can give this particular connection a name, hit save, and then it will pop up another window asking us to select our account, sign in, and then authorize that. So you just follow the wizard there um, to do that. Once we have that connection done, let's use my existing one here, then we can start to select options as to how we want uh, this particular module to work. So each one of these is a module. So here I've got my trigger module. I could also create um, action modules. This one's going to add a row. Uh, this one's going to, let's say, update an existing row, etc. Each one of them will go with that connection and then we'll have options that you can select. So that is the basic format of make. You have a bunch of modules. One is a trigger and then a number of actions. Um, actions can also be searches. So we might say uh, get a cell and that will pull in information from a particular place that we can then use for uh, future actions. So actually we might um, click on, sorry, right click on this connection and unlink it so that we can push it, put this module in between those two there. And if we move them all along, yeah, I see that a bit better. There's also an auto line button down the bottom here to make them all in a nice line. Okay, now before we go too much further, let's talk about um, plans and actions. So in with Integromat, you have a plan that you've selected and that will have a certain number of actions per month. Or here it calls it operations. So depending on how many operations you'll need, uh, it will cost more. Most people will go with this core plan uh, unless you do need to have multiple users, in which case you might need to go with the Teams one. So you can see here, uh, 10,000 operations is $9 up to you stack it up to like 150,000, 500,000 is $330 per month. So there is definitely a difference in cost depending on how many operations you need per month. So in this video, I'm going to talk about optimizing our operations. So we're getting the same effect done with fewer operations because it is really possible to make inefficient automations where you're using up a lot of operations just to get a simple thing done. Um, and so if you were to build all your automations doing that, you'd end up spending a lot more per month and per year. Whereas if you follow the advice that I give you, um, you should hopefully save hundreds of dollars a year uh, compared to that. On that note, I've made a free short make course with this video and several others to help you build the most optimal automations. You can get it from the link in the video description or go to workmanagement.tools forward slash make. Okay, cool. So now let me know about operations and plans. Uh, let's dive into trigger types. So there are two different trigger types. One is, I'll call it polling. So this is using the API. And basically what it does is it has two different platforms. So here I've got make, and it's talking in this case to ClickUp. So make will send a question saying, hey, are there any changes? The platform, in this case ClickUp, will say yes or no, and then it will wait the amount of time that you set, you can change this, uh, and then it will ask again. And this time, okay, it says yes, there were five changes, and we'll have the information for those changes, and we'll kind of process them through the automation. Then it will wait again for 15 minutes, and then ask again, get another response. So what this means, if any changes happen within those 15 minute or however long it is section, um, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen until the next time that make asks if there have been any changes. So that's when you get a bit of a delay between things happening and uh, the automation firing in, in make. It also means that you'll probably fire multiple times at once because there could have been multiple changes in that time period. Um, so we'll talk a little bit later about what this is good for. Sometimes this is preferable, sometimes this is not preferable. People will often ask, can we reduce this time down to five minutes or one minute? Um, and yes, that's possible, but we need to look at the math a little bit. So in terms of operation cost, uh, if we're checking once every 15 minutes, a check is one operation. So we have four actions per hour, because it's one every 15 minutes, times 24 hours, so that's 96 actions per day. If we do that for a whole month, then we have 2,880 actions per month, and that's just for checking. So if you're doing the, the, the base cost of uh, $9 per month for a make, uh, that only gives you 10,000 actions. So you can only be running three of these automations, and this is not even including taking any actions, like the, act, the automation doing anything. This is purely the cost of checking. So it's quite high. Now, if you were to change that to every five minutes, well, that's gonna be three times higher. So you'd use up 9,000 actions just for one automation. Uh, and if you were to change it to one minute, then that's gonna be uh, five times higher than that again. So that's 45,000 actions per month just for checking. 
Um, so that's going to start costing way too much money. So usually when we're polling, we want to kind of make the time period as big as possible. So if we could check only once every hour, that would be great. Um, some automations only need to run once a day. So we can check once every 24 hours and that's great as well. So when we want things to happen quickly, um, there is another way of doing it. And that is to have a webhook type trigger. So basically a webhook is when you set it up, again, we've got this two platforms. When you set it up, make or tell ClickUp, hey, every time this thing happens, tell me about it. And so that's just permanently set up. So when it runs, instead of make having to check every 15 minutes or five minutes or whatever, um, as soon as the thing happens in the platform, the platform will tell make about it. And so it's instant. And so there's no, the, the gap between it letting um, make know what happened. And it could be one minute, it could be two days. You know, it just depends when the next time it happens is. It's, it's very um, flexible. So this is really good in terms of it's much faster and it will only use up the number of operations that it needs. Um, that being said, sometimes the webhooks aren't very specific. So it might um, send the webhook too often. So uh, ClickUp is a platform I use a lot. For example, in ClickUp, there's no webhook to say a custom field value has changed. But what it can do is say, hey, a task has been updated. So it'll tell, it'll say a task has been updated each time, but there are many, many ways of updating a task. So a lot of the time it's gonna be a false positive. So we can filter out false positives and that's totally fine, um, but it does mean we're gonna use up a decent amount of operations in false positives. Um, and so that kind of, that cost is, is there to be assessed against whether or not it's better to have that versus the, the cost of constantly checking with that um, polling trigger type. Okay, let's have a look at those triggers in IntegraMap. So if we create a new scenario here, we'll hit the plus button here to add a new module. Uh, after the first one, you will use this plus button down the bottom to then select uh, platforms and then the modules within them. So for right now, let's go with Google Sheets. Okay, and we can see a couple of things on the top here. So this instant tag, this instant tag means it's a webhook. Whereas this uh, top one here, uh, this is a polling one. So you can see it's got the little clock icon. Say, okay, this is gonna check every certain amount of time. Whereas if we were to right click and delete that module and go with the instant one, you'd see it's got the lightning bolt. That means it's a webhook. And so of course we need to immediately set up our webhook. So here I'll add a webhook, we'll give it a name, and that's it. So what that means is there are no options to set up that webhook. All it's gonna do is watch the cheat sheet for changes. And so there could be lots of different types of changes that could come through. In this case, we can see that it only works uh, on changes made in the Google Sheet app and the Sheets add-on is required. So we may add some extra information uh, with that particular uh, browser add-on. So let's switch to a different module here. Let's go to one of our ClickUp ones. So again, we have a very similar thing. We've got watch tasks, which is a webhook one, and watch tasks that is just a polling one. We can choose between them. So let's now go to our um, webhook one. And here we can add a webhook. And this one has some options. So we choose our name, our connection, but then we can also choose where uh, within ClickUp we want this to trigger from. So rather than triggering on literally everything, we're gonna choose uh, certain places. So we can choose to only uh, trigger on one space, folder, list, or task. And that's kind of the, the hierarchy of ClickUp. We'll choose a list here, and we'll say exactly which list we want it to uh, trigger on. So here it's only gonna trigger on changes in the sales pipeline list. And then we can also choose what kind of events we want it to trigger on. So for example, when only when tasks are created, or both created and updated, or deleted, etc., you can get to some specific ones. So for example, only when task status changes, that's really useful because it's more specific, it'll trigger less often, only when we want it. Um, however, unfortunately, a common one that I, I like to use is when a custom field value has changed and that doesn't exist here. So in that case, we're just gonna have to go with task updated. It's the more generic one. So we'll hit save. Okay, and when that happens, perhaps we want to create a new row in a spreadsheet with some of the information from that updated task. So again, we'll select our uh, mode. We can either manually select the spreadsheet or can have it kind of be selected by the automation, by information coming through. Here we'll just select it manually. Once we select our spreadsheet, I'll have some extra options. So here I need to choose which page or which sheet in the spreadsheet. 
and then it will load in my different uh, columns. So because I'm adding a row, I need to put in some information. For now, we're just gonna put in the word hi in column A. Okay, so now we've got a trigger and an action. However, remembering our, our webhook trigger is pulling in too many uh, updates. It's pulling in updates that we don't actually want. So what we'll do is we'll click on the line between them and create a filter. From here we'll call it, give it a name. I'll call it only if um, update is custom field. And then we can put in a condition. And so here we can pull information that came through when that uh, trigger was triggered. So here I'll go into history items and after, uh, and we want to have the source. Now we want to kind of get an idea of what information will come through there. So we'll right click this and go run this module only. And now it's going to go look for some changes. So we'll go into ClickUp and we'll create some changes. So here we've got our sales pipeline, I think we selected, and we said any update. So here we'll change an update, we'll add a settlement date. And we'll see that's now been picked up, and we can see what information came through. So in history items, we've got field is custom field, and after is the value. So that's a, that's a date value in a, I think it's the Unix format. So we've got history items, after, I think it was field that we wanted. Yeah. We could filter on name, so we're just pulling out a specific custom field. Let's have again, look again. So we've got history items field. So that would trigger on any custom field. Or we can go custom field and then name is settlement date. So it depends what you want. In this case, let's say we only want to trigger on that one custom field. So we'll say only if updated field is settlement date and then we'll say that the field name is equal to settlement date and make sure you have no extra spaces in there so now every time that triggers it will only continue through to the action if the thing that was updated was settlement date so that's how we can take a really wide webhook and kind of filter it down to only be very specific so we will use up extra actions. We'll use up um, one action per time that the webhook was triggered, but the rest of the whole automation will only go off if it passes this filter. So that's how you can use webhooks, even if you don't have the specific webhook you want available. Okay, so this add row, this is one type of action. Another type of action is called a search, and it's really useful to pull in uh, information. So Google Sheets has some good ones. Down the bottom here, we've got searches. So we're we'll, we'll adding a search row module uh, and here we're going to look up a row. So we've got our connection set. We'll choose which sheet we want to look up, uh, which column range we'll look at. Here I don't have that many columns, so I'll just go A to Z. And then we're our filter. So here we're going to look in column A, and we're going to find an ID. So let's say that we're going to use our task ID from ClickUp. Um, so in this case, uh, to have this uh, be effective, we will want to have a spreadsheet set up with various task IDs in column A. Okay. And then we'd have relevant information uh, in the other columns for each of those tasks. We'll talk a little bit later about um, how you'd set up a index like this. Okay, so we're looking in column A for our task ID uh, and it's going to find the correct row. So that can be really useful if we need to change something, but we don't know exactly where it is. We can have the automation go and find that thing for us. And now we have the information from that row it found and also we'll have the ID of that row it found. Okay, so we'll run that module. We'll go one, two, three, four, which is one of the values I typed in, and we'll see that it managed to find that uh, row. So it has the value there, the row number is one, and so we've got the spreadsheet ID and sheet name there. So we can now use all of that in future modules. So searches are really useful for finding other information in a particular platform that didn't come through with the trigger. Sometimes you need information from multiple places before you can take uh, the relevant actions that you need. So for example, this one might actually go after that one. And so we pull in information from ClickUp, we find some extra information from a uh, row, and then we take the action of creating this new row. Okay, now when we set up actions, you can see here that we can map values. So in our row that we're creating, we have uh, what we want to put in in each one of the columns. In each one of the columns, we can select values from the past modules. So here we can select information from our triggering task. 
Now, what it sends through this particular trigger is only information about what the change was. It doesn't give us the full information of the task. So here we could actually add an extra module and we say get a task, and that will get all the information for that particular task. And so in this module, it'll ask us what the task ID is that we want to get, and we'll use the task ID from that previous module. So we'll map in that information. So each time that this automation runs, that value is going to be different. That will map to whatever the triggering task ID is. So that's why we call it mapping. So we'll map in that task ID, and then when that uh, runs, it will pull in all the information for that task, which can then be used in this later action. So let's test that out for a second. Let's go into ClickUp, and here we'll grab a task, uh, get the task ID, and then we'll run this module. Make sure we take out that hash. Cool. And so now it's sent through all the information for that task. So in this module here, we can now map in information from the original trigger module here or from the get task module. So it might be in column A, we'll put the task name. In column B, uh, maybe we'll put, put the name of the assignee or actually the name of the creator. So create a username. In column C, uh, we might put a you know a custom field for the deal size, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's mapping. Now you can make that a little bit more advanced. We have a bunch of tabs across the top here. So the first tab is information from previous modules. The second tab is some logical operators. Uh, if is a really common one. So if something is true, then put in a certain value. If not, put in another value. Uh, you can also put in brackets. Um, just typing in brackets regularly won't work. You do need to select the the correct uh, function from this, this tab. Then we have a math tab. So here we can do some uh, functions. So this deal size one, that was a number. So we could go deal size plus 20. And the value that it'll put into Google Sheets is whatever the deal size was in ClickUp plus 20. And again, you can't just type in plus, you do have to select the correct um, operator from within this tab. There's various other functions there. If you're familiar with spreadsheet formulas, um, those will kind of make sense to you. If not, we won't go into them in this video. If you hover over them, they'll give you some information about how they work. Okay, third tab is text functions. So a common one here might be if you were to strip HTML. So if you have a field from a module coming in that's got HTML in it, you might put in the strip HTML and then put that value in between the brackets. And so it will just take out all that HTML and leave you with plain text. Um, so let's pretend that this has some HTML in it. Okay, next one is date, date and time tab. So you have various functions here to deal with dates. So a really common one is to format the date. So you saw before that the date came in in that uh, Unix value. So let's choose here one of our dates. Let's just run that again so we get the information. We'll jump back into ClickUp and we'll change that date again. So we'll change the settlement date to be 16. Okay, so we had some information come in and under oh, the after value, here we go, is a Unix date value. So we're going to format date and we'll pull that in. So we want after and then we'll format it into a, uh, a more readable format. So you can see here the different formats available, dd.mm.yearyearyear. Um, if you are a day first person or if you're American, you might go month, month, slash, Day, day slash year, 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 year. And so it's going to turn that into that particular format, uh, which is perhaps more useful for us. Okay, and then finally we have the array tab. That's a little bit more complex. Um, if you are dealing with arrays, it's got some options to do that there. But in general, that's how you use formulas. Most of the time, you'll be using either you know math operators or some if functions, perhaps, or none at all if you're just simply mapping um, values from previous modules straight through. One useful one that's a smidge more complex, but I do want to point it out here is this get option. So here we can use get to pull in a, an array. So this here, we've got tags and then that um, opening and closing bracket, that's an array. Um, we can exceed what's in it, but sometimes that doesn't load properly. Sometimes we can't. So sometimes we simply have to select the whole array. Now that can't print out as, as text because it's, it's, it's a much more complex um, data structure. So the get uh, function will allow us to pull a particular value out. So here it says, We've got the array 
and then the path name and you use dots. So if it's multiple levels, you use the name of the first level and then dot and then the name of the second level. So here we can see that uh, tags, actually let's go into one of the ones we have in here. Okay, so history item is a, it's actually an array. Array and collection are very similar. So number one is a collection. And then we have custom fields as an array. So what we could do here is we could say get and then we'll put in the entirety of history items. And then the first one was one. So we'll go history items one dot custom and it'll have different um, names. So here we can look at custom fields. If you hover over it, you can see the actual name of it. It's uh, got the underscore. So custom underscore field. So one dot custom underscore field dot and then whatever the third level is. So we might say um, name. So one dot custom field dot name. And so what that's going to do is it's going to look through history items, find number one, find custom fields, and give us the net value for name. So a little bit more advanced, but occasionally it does, you do need that to be able to pull information out of, a, out of a collection or an array. Okay, now we'll delete this search one because it's not actually doing anything right now. And then we'll try running this whole operation. So we'll jump into ClickUp. We'll again change that settlement date. And we'll see what happens. So we've got it, we've got the task, it's passed the filter, and now it's added that row to Google Sheets. Now if we have a look in Google Sheets, we can see it's added the name of the task, the creator, C was the um, deal value plus 20, and then it gave us that URL with HTML removed, uh, the date in a more readable format, and the name of that custom field. Perfect. And so now we can turn that on and have that run every single time a uh, date has, is updated in that settlement field column. Okay, so I want to clarify those collections and arrays a little bit, so let's have a look. So this is the uh, data format that data comes through in, in, in Make. So this is the output of a get task module, essentially. So I want to point out some of the structural elements here. So first of all, you have the bundle. So each time it were to get a task, one packet of information is called a bundle. Um, so if it, if it were to get the task you know, five times, we'd end up with five bundles. So this whole thing, you can see at the top it expands uh, into the bundle. Then we have keys. So each one of these lines is essentially a key. And a key has the, the name and then the value. And then we have collections or arrays. And they are essentially keys. They have more information uh, kind of nested below them. So the status key uh, has several keys within it. And so it's not actually, we call it a collection rather than a key. Now collection and arrays, basically the same thing. The difference is collections have different things within them. So this one's got ID, status, color, order, type, etc. Whereas arrays, everything in it is the same type. Um, so here we've got watchers as an array. So it's got like watcher one, watcher two, watcher three, watcher four. They're all the same type of information um, rather than being different types. So hopefully that helps a little bit with clarifying the terminology. Okay, next up I want to show you routing and branching. So here we have a trigger. Uh, we're kind of pulling in some information and then we've got an action. But it's possible we might want to have two different actions depending on you know, uh, some sort of condition. So what we might do here is we'll clone this uh, module. And then what we'll do is we will add a flow control router so that we can split into two different branches here. So we'll connect that router into the, the workflow and then we can connect multiple uh, modules to that router. Now, right now, both of those uh, branches are gonna be taken simultaneously. So we'll do this action and this action. And we don't really want that. We kind of want to choose, have it choose one or the other. So we might say, let's, let's move this particular um, filter here back towards the start, which is probably where it should be. So we'll put it on this very first uh, filter option here. Okay, so that filter is now there. And now we can delete it over here. So perhaps we might want to choose, it could be anything, but let's say we want to put it in a different sheet depending on uh, where that task lives. So let's say the condition is from our get task module, uh, we can go with list name. So if list name 
is equal to sales pipeline, then do this action. And then we can say if something else. In this case, I'm just going to say if it's not. So we say from our get task action, this name. And let's say not equal to. Uh, not equal to sales pipeline. Also, be really aware of these filters. Uh, it has different types of operators. So it's got basic, text, uh, numeric, date, time, and time, boolean, and array. You need to make sure you select the right type. So here I'm using the text not equal to. So it's going to look for a text value, which the name of the list is. If I were to put it as numeric not equal to, then it would look for a number. And it wouldn't get a number and it would get confused and the filter wouldn't work. So you just need to make sure that you match the data type with the type of operator. So the most common are text and, and number, and they're pretty easy to tell apart. Um, time, that's pretty straightforward. Boolean is like um, yes or no. So if you had like a checkbox, that might come through as a Boolean value. Uh, but generally, you just need to select between uh, text and numeric. So if it is not equal to sales pipeline, then it will do this action. So now we have basically a decision um, branching out to two different things. And in this, if not one, I might change uh, perhaps which sheet I want it to go into, or I might change the values. In some way, this action will be different. So that is basically how you do routing in, in Meg. You simply put in a router, and you attach multiple actions to it, and then you can choose uh, what the filter is for each one. Or if you want to have both happen, you might have um, no filters, and so they all split into two and start taking both actions simultaneously. Okay, the final thing to look at here is scheduling. So before we turn this on, we should make sure it's scheduled properly. Now, scheduling is a little bit different depending on whether you're using a polling or a webhook trigger. So one run of the scenario, and that's a keyword there, run. So one time that the scenario operates is basically, well, for, for a polling trigger, it's when, that, when it looks for that answer, when it looks for are there any changes and the, the response comes back. For a webhook, it's whenever that um, the platform lets you know that the the thing has happened. So that's one run. Within one run, you can have multiple cycles. So in this case, because we had five changes, it would run five cycles that each cycle completes those automation steps. For the webhook, because it triggers every time the thing happens, it will only ever have one cycle. So it's kind of one trigger, one cycle, because it can just trigger, you know, it could trigger five times in the same minute. Um, and so it would have five runs, each with one cycle. So in general, polling ones will trigger less often, but have more cycles. Webhooks will trigger more often, but only ever have one cycle. Within that cycle, it will then pass through a bundle of information. So we saw that before, um, one bundle is one packet of information, and so each cycle will have one bundle. And same thing for webhooks as well. Now I've set here one initial bundle, because we might choose some actions that create extra bundles. So for example, uh, let's say in ClickUp, we have list all tasks. So we'll, we'll choose a particular list and it will list all tasks in that particular list and each one of those will be in its own bundle. So we'll kind of have one bundle going through here and I'll hit this and it might create say 50 bundles because there are 50 tasks in that list. So they will then start processing through the rest of autom automation one at a time. So you usually would want to filter immediately after that to only filter down to the particular bundles we want or well, there's some more advanced things you can do. You can do a array aggregator kind of pull those bundles back into one bundle. We won't go into that in this video, uh, but just so you know what, what the bundles are. And that sometimes you can create extra bundles uh, in the middle of an automation. Uh, be careful because each, each time a module does an action, that's one operation. And so if you have 50 bundles and then another module here, and let's say uh, edit a task, and you send 50, 50 bundles through this, this module is gonna run 50 times, taking up 50 operations. So just be careful of, of creating you know, huge amounts of bundles. Cool. Okay, so that's our, th these are our basic terminology for scheduling. So if we jump back into make, now because we've got a, a webhook trigger here, the scheduling is really simple. It's just, it runs immediately when the, when the um, webhook is triggered. So if we delete that and instead go to a polling uh, trigger, uh, we put in the various information there, now I'm gonna skip that. Now we've got more options. So here we're saying at regular intervals, every 15 minutes. 
and you could choose you know once a day certain days of the week etc um, again be careful not to make this too low you can go as low as one that will use up a crazy amount of actions um, the longer you can set it the better so if you go 60 minutes great um, if you can do it um, once per day that's um, even better some some you know, I have a thing that sets up something in the morning and I wouldn't want it to run more than once a day if it ran more than once a day it would be in my way so um, that can be really good as well um, if you do need to have it reasonably short you can do some advanced scheduling um, to say hey look only run during business hours so let's say from you know 9 a.m till 5 p.m so at least it's not wasting operations at night when no one really needs it when you can also say you know don't run on weekends most people will be working most months but maybe you wouldn't have it run in december or something so you can make some edits to the scheduling just to kind of minimize the uh the time that this is actually active for now, if you want to get the full toolkit, I've made a short course covering the other key concepts I didn't have time to get to in this video. It's free and you can get it in the link in the video description or we're going to workmanagement.tools forward slash make. We'll turn you into an automations master in no time. I'll see you in there.